Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go, where could I go, seeking a refuge for my soul? Needing a friend to help me in the end, where could I go but to the Lord? Number two. Neighbors are kind, I love them everyone. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Number three. Life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go, where could I go, seeking a refuge for my soul? Needing a friend to help me in the end, where could I go but to the Lord? And a very good evening to all of you. Welcome to White Oak Baptist Church on this Wednesday evening. And it's been just a gorgeous day outside and uh, been wonderful. Uh, we moved into our new home a week and a half ago or so. There is a pool in our backyard, and I'm just keep waiting for it to get hot enough to actually get in it. So, uh, but uh, no, I'm not complaining. We're, we've been enjoying that very much. It's uh, going to be a special night tonight. Uh, uh, my brother, uh, James, is here. If you can't see him, it's because you're blind. Um, are you six foot five, six foot six, six foot ten? ish okay so uh you all thought i was tall if he had become your pastor you would have had the pulpit up to about here hey uh, raised the pulpit up after i became pastor but uh, anyway we're excited to have him here him and his wife susie they got married back in december and uh we'll say more about him in just a few minutes but he's gonna be preaching for us tonight how many of you remember those stories i told about my brother who um uh, got out of bed a hundred times and, and this is that brother so <laughs> Um, if he starts misbehaving, one of you elderly states ladies, just go over and whack him upside the back of the head. And he, uh, he was used to that in church, so uh, no, uh, but uh, he'll get me back, I'm sure, when it's his turn to get up here. I'm sure he's got some good juicy stories for all of you, but we're really excited about having him here. I come up behind you, so I get the mic last, so you better behave, okay? I'm going to keep a couple in the, in, on the back stove, back burner, just in case you misbehave yourself up here. But uh, let's greet one another in the Lord. Shake, shake, shake someone's hand you haven't seen yet tonight. We'll come back and, and sing that chorus in a moment. I'm not sure if I got the official hands. There you go. It's official. <laughs> That's all you need. Amen. Let's sing that chorus as we find our seats. Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Amen. All right, let's open the service with a word of prayer this evening. So good to see Elizette Monks back in her place. She was out Sunday with a hurt knee. That's what she gets for kicking her, kicking her husband and son in the, around all the time. She hurt her knee. No, kicking James around. I'm sure he deserved it. Yeah, yeah. I know how Jameses are. Yeah, I know all about that. Yeah, but uh, no. But good, good. Glad you're back. Glad you're feeling somewhat better. And praise the Lord for that. We pray for you on Sunday and throughout the week. Uh, let's go to the Lord and ask God to be with us this evening and meet with us in a special way tonight. And we'd ask uh, Mike Yankowski, if you would, from the back, raise your voice, lead us in prayer this, this evening. Thank 
Amen. Amen. You can be seated. All right. If you have a prayer request slip that has been filled out and you'd like to turn that in, if you'd hold that up, the ones that are folded in half will stay between you and the pastor. The ones that are not folded in half will be read for the church. Ushers, are you ready to receive those prayer request slips? If you have a prayer request slip that's been filled out, if you'll just hold that up. If you need one, if you'll hold up an empty hand, hand and we'll get you one. Justin down here needs a prayer request slip, and so we'll get him one. How many are working on filling one out and you need another minute? Anybody? Right here in the front. You guys are not needy people tonight, huh? No prayer request slips. Everything's great in your lives. Everything's good. Amen. All right, Brother Screw, we'll have you come up and take over the prayer service at this time. Just fill it out. Now, if you, if you fold it, it will stay between me and you. If you don't, Brother Screw, Brother Screw read it out. Okay, good evening. Uh, I have a, one request that uh, was given uh, verbally by Pauline. Uh, we'll pray for, for her daughter. And um, when Jason, when you're right, done with that, just bring it up, okay? All right. Um, okay, why don't we... Uh, oh, Justin, I'm sorry. Uh, the gentlemen, if they'd like to come forward uh, and uh, pray, we'll, we'll begin. Um, and then uh, Mike Jankowski is going to help me out with the, the prayer this evening. Uh, why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you again for this opportunity to come before your throne of grace. And uh, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be in the house of the Lord this evening. And uh, Lord, we come um, for, for two reasons, to primarily uh, one, to hear the preaching of the word of God. And uh, Lord, we do pray that the, the preaching of the word of God would be done uh, with boldness. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would uh, fill uh, uh, Brother Jim, James, uh, as he preaches. I pray, Lord, that... Uh, if, you're, if, you, if we need some conviction, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would certainly bring the conviction upon each one of us as needed. And uh, Lord, help us to uh, have a, have make some changes in our own life if, that, if it's necessary. Now, Lord, I do pray also for this prayer time. I uh, pray for uh, uh, Pauline's daughter, Pauline. Uh, she has an uh, uh, interview tomorrow for a job. And uh, Lord, I just uh, ask that you'd uh, work there, that you'd give... Uh, Pauline's daughter, a uh, calmness and a peace, and uh, everything would go well. And Lord, may, this may be the job that uh, you have, in, intent, in, have intentions for her to have. I don't know. But Lord, I pray that uh, your will would be done in the matter. And then, Lord, we also pray, I, I um, lift up some of the folks that are in our bulletin. I, I pray for uh, uh, George Harvey's uh, prayer request for uh, Patty Stumpo for salvation, as well as uh, Freddie's mom for salvation, and uh, Larry Booth, uh, Joe, he has here for salvation. So, Lord, we do lift these uh, three uh, names up before your throne of grace, uh, Lord, but, but we just don't lift them up. Uh, uh, we lift them up individually, yes, but we, we lift up everybody that's on our prayer request. And, and Lord, we lift up uh, the souls of uh, men and women and children that are lost. We pray, Lord, that uh, we know that your desire is to save each and every one of them. And so, Lord, I pray uh, that we would have a like-minded desire to see uh, every soul saved, that we wouldn't uh, count any soul uh, unworthy, but everybody uh, have opportunity to uh, get saved. Uh, so, Lord, we do pray that you would work in that way, and, uh, and uh, God, your grace would be upon them. And, uh, Lord, even as uh, we'll hear from Brother James shortly, as he, as he goes to a foreign field, we lift up those people as well. And then, Lord, we also lift up uh, our president, Donald Trump, uh, we lift him up and ask that you would uh, work in his heart, work in his life, uh, Lord, that he would uh, be submissive to your, your will and your leading, and uh, Lord, that, he would, uh, that you would put a hedge of protection around him, too, uh, just to keep him safe, and, and, but, but keep him in the, in the right mind, the right frame of mind, and uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you know, he would just, uh, um, if he's not saved, I pray that he would get saved. And then, Lord, we also pray for our, uh, right here in Stratford, Mayor Harkins. We, we lift up him before you too, Lord, and ask that you would protect him and give him wisdom as he, uh, as he uh, leads and directs. And this, uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, what it completely says here. So, Lord, I'm just going to, I'm going to uh, pray for this one individually. I, I just need to look at it and, and, and understand it and uh, not try to just... Uh, Try to, try to make mistakes as, as we lift up this prayer. So, Lord, I just pray uh, for, for Justin's uh, need. 
uh, that uh, whatever it is here, that it would, uh, we, would, we would lift it up before your throne of grace and, and uh, regarding family or family member, uh, Lord, that uh, you would uh, understand and, and know his heart and uh, just do a will uh, there in, 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 in the person's heart. Now, Lord, we uh, thank, for, thank you for this time, and uh, we ask that you'd guide and direct, uh, and I pray that uh, everything will go well this evening and that you'd be honored and glorified through this uh, service tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we come to your throne of grace, Lord, and which these uh, medical needs that are listed on this uh, bulletin here. Uh, Lord, we know that without you, we can do nothing. Lord, and uh, we just put these prayer requests, Lord, we lay them at your feet. Lord God, I pray that you'd be attentive. Lord, I pray that you'd hear from heaven. Lord, I pray that you'd answer, Lord, in one way or the other. Lord, I pray that we'd hear from you. Lord, uh, Pam here, Suzaki has a friend, Patty, who's going for surgery on 7-7, uh, Lord, for cancer. And Lord, she's not uh, saved. Uh, she doesn't know the Lord. Lord, uh, cancer is very serious. It's a, it's a life or death situation in a lot of cases. Lord, and I pray that this time in her life, Lord, that she would think about her eternity. Lord, that you'd put it all on her heart, Lord, that this life is so fleeting. I pray, Lord, you put it upon her heart that she would think about where she's going to wind up if things don't go well. I, put, I pray, Lord, you put it upon her heart that there would be someone there by her bedside, Lord, that would lead her to you, Lord, the God of salvation. Lord, I know that you, God, that you can do anything, that you can heal her if you so desire. Lord, but we ask that your will be done. And, and the most important thing is that she would know you, Lord, either way it goes, that she has an eternity in heaven. Lord, we pray for Elder Set, Lord, where the, she injured her knee. Lord, I don't know what kind of, how it is now. Lord, but I pray that uh, your hand of blessing would be upon it. Lord, that it's not a serious thing that she'd be able to use it, Lord, in her work or as she goes to and fro, I pray that you won't give her husband also in her, in her church. Lord, that's lifting her up. And, and Lord, we're obligated as Christians, Lord, to do the same. Lord, we do lift her up. Lord, we pray that this cancer is not, uh, that are coming up. Lord, that you know all about those. And, I don't, Lord, but you do, and that's what's the important thing. Lord, we lift up our sister, Pat Blake. Lord, I pray that you'd strengthen her in her body, strengthen her physically. Lord, strengthen her spiritually. Give her wisdom, Lord, and, and what to do, Lord, in the situation that, that, uh, that she's in right now. Lord, uh, she needs all the strength and wisdom and spiritual, spiritual power that that you can muster, Lord. Uh, please help her, lift her up, give her encouragement and hope. Lord, we also pray for missionary uh, Jerry Collins in Mexico. Lord, uh, I don't know what part of Mexico he's in, Lord, but Mexico is, is Mexico. And uh, there's a lot of things that go on down there same thing that goes on up here, Lord. He needs, first of all, spiritual guidance, spiritual strength. Second of all, physical protection for him and his family. Third of all, Lord, he needs wisdom in how to conduct his, his outreach. And Lord, he needs uh, finances, Lord, that I pray that they would continue to come in. Lord, I pray you'd give him uh, fruit for his labors down there in Mexico. Lord, and we also pray for Millie Dorn. Lord, she's a shut-in, been that way for a long time. 
Lord, uh, I pray that you'd help her. I pray you'd give her strength, Lord. I pray that she gets all, all the spiritual help that she can muster. I pray that she's faithful to reading her Bible. Lord, I pray that, I don't know if she watches anything on uh, live stream services, Lord, but I, I pray that she does. And I pray, Lord, that you just uh, help her not to be downcast or depressed. Lord, help her to uh, accept where she, is, where she is, Lord, and help her to know that, that you're on her side and that you're in her and, and uh, uh, guide her and, and quicken her in her spirit, Lord. And we also pray for uh, uh, one of our college students, Maggie. Lord, as she uh, continues her, her studies, Lord, I pray you'd give her wisdom. I pray that you'd keep her uh, from, the, from any kind of bad influences in, in school and in the colleges there where she's at. Lord, I pray you'd help her, uh, keep her safe as she's gonna travel back and forth and I pray, Lord, that you uh, help her as she does her studies, Lord, and that she would complete them in the time allowed. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, all right, let's take our hymnals again and turn, if you would, to hymn 330. We'll sing, Look to the Lamb of God, the first and the fourth first and the fourth and let's all stand let's all stand please <clears throat> if you from sin are looking to be free look to the lamb of god he to redeem you died on calvary look to the lamb of god Look to the Lamb of God, look to the Lamb of God, for He alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God. Number four. Fear not when shadows on your pathway fall, look to the Lamb of God. In joy or sorrow, Christ is all in all. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. For He alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God. You can be seated. We're going to allow... Um, uh, my brother, uh, James, again, is here with us tonight, and I'm going to allow him to take just a few minutes and uh, present uh, his uh, video that uh, they have about their work, and also just make a few short comments, and then uh, beyond that, we'll have you come up and preach a little bit later. So this time, James, you come up, introduce again your wife to everyone. Some people have slipped in late, and then uh, let us see your work there. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, Pastor. And... Um, uh, my wife and I just wanted to say before we get, I go any further, thank you, uh, Brother Levine took us out to some Chinese, and uh, so thank you for, uh, for doing that, for taking us out to, for some good food. And uh, real fast, uh, before you see the video, there's a lot that the video has, so I won't need to say everything, but I'll have, go ahead and have my wife stand up. This is Susie, and uh, I met her actually down in Honduras on the field, and I went down there single, and I, I found a, a wife. And we got married six months ago, so praise the Lord. And uh, God has someone for everybody, amen. And so, uh, and I'm very appreciative of her. Uh, she got in Honduras uh, in 2011, and she's been down there for a while. And uh, I arrived in 2015. And uh, through a series of circumstances, the Lord works, opens doors, amen, and uh, arrived in Honduras. And basically what I, what I do, uh, the main thing is uh, help in the seminary, uh, 2010, uh, I worked with Pastor Sam and Miss uh, Julie Hodges and their ministry. In 2010, they started the New Life Baptist Seminary. And uh, through the seminary, we train young nationals, uh, young men and women who they graduate from high school 
and uh, they, we train them for the ministry. And uh, this is the only Bible college of its kind, and as you'll see it in the video. And uh, there's a few uh, students. Uh, I'll just highlight one for, for the sake of time real fast, but there's one student that, um, I, I, that I just wanted to highlight. And there's several that you'll see in the video, uh, but one of them I'm thinking, his name is uh, Alex. I was talking to him recently and um, before we came here uh, to the States, and uh, he expressed to me, his, he has a desire, he's really felt in his heart ever since he was a teenager, God wants him to be a missionary in Haiti, or to go to Haiti as missionary. And, uh, you know, you think of that, and that is, uh, you know, you always think of sending missionaries out of uh, America, but uh, there are lots of young people who feel God, uh, God's call in their life, uh, be, be it to go to another country or be it, uh, to be a pastor there. And so uh, our vision is to be there and to work with young people and uh, train them, to teach them, to be able to go on to other parts of the country and uh, start and plant churches with the nationals. And amen. Let's go ahead and start show the video. Right in the heart of Central America lies the country of Honduras. Its population is approximately 10 million. While the primary religion is still Catholicism, that is quickly changing. Much of the younger generation is now more open-minded, and Satan is filling those open minds with other religions, cults, and worldly philosophies. In the Honduran educational system, evolution is now being taught as fact, while the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons are sending their missionaries in droves. Now, more than ever, there is a need to plant solid, independent Baptist churches. While most of the central corridor of Honduras has been covered by good missionaries, much of the east and west remains completely neglected. What is the most effective way to start churches in these areas? One option is for missionaries to go start churches in those neglected areas of Honduras. But with ever-changing residency and visa laws, the doors for missionaries to any given country could close at any time. On the other hand, sending well-equipped national pastors to start those same churches would probably provide a more long-lasting and effective outcome. Hi, we're the Lichurns. My wife and I met here on the mission field in Honduras, and my wife and I have been serving alongside missionary Sam and Julie Hodges since 2015. I grew up in a Christian home on the mission field. When I was seven years old, I realized for the first time that I was a sinner and didn't deserve heaven. I went forward with my mom one Thursday night at church and asked Jesus to come into my heart and save me. I was baptized when I was 12 years old. During my senior year of high school at a Christian camp, I surrendered to full-time Christian service, never expecting to end up on the mission field. After graduating from Bible college, God opened the door to teach in Honduras, where I have been since 2011. I first met my husband James when he visited Honduras on a missions trip. Although we never conversed with each other, I was encouraged by my pastor's wife to begin praying for him. The following year he returned to Honduras, but this time to become part of our team. It was not long before I realized he was after me. We were married in the United States during Christmas vacation, 16 months after meeting each other. Through the time of being on the mission field, God has been so good to me and blessed in so many ways. Like Susie, I grew up in a Christian home. On a Sunday afternoon when I was just five years old, I knelt down with my mom in our living room and prayed to ask Jesus to save me. I soon followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Later in my teenage years at a youth conference, I surrendered my life to missions. Just two years after graduating from Bible college, God opened the door to go to Honduras with the purpose of training nationals by teaching in the New Life Baptist Seminary. God has called me to the unique ministry of coming alongside another missionary to help train men and women for a lifetime of service to God with the goal of reaching Honduras and the world with the gospel. I'm missionary Sam Hodges and the New Life Baptist Church was founded in 1998. In 2006, we began the New Life Christian School, and then in 2010, the New Life Baptist Seminary to train Honduran pastors and pastor's wives. The New Life Baptist Seminary focuses on training well-rounded servants. Students receive academic classes which build their biblical foundation, as well as character training and practical preparation. 
Hola, mi nombre es Wilmer Flores. Hello, my name is Wilmer Flores. The grace of God came to my life when I was 12 years old. I was called to serve the Lord full time when I was 15. Right now, I'm studying at New Life Baptist Seminary. New Life Baptist Seminary has taught me how to stretch myself in the work of the Lord and how to grow spiritually. One of my future goals is to plant a church with members who are committed to service for the Lord. Hola, mi nombre es Karina Sandoval. Hi, my name is Karina Sandoval. I came to understand the gospel completely and accept Jesus when I was 16 years old. Later, when I entered the university, I became somewhat rebellious and the Lord showed me that I was going in the wrong direction. I attended a youth camp where God called me to serve Him full time and prepare myself at New Life Baptist Seminary. My desire is to serve God and to do it in the best way possible. The New Life Baptist Seminary has had a great impact in my life and has helped me tremendously in my spiritual growth. Hello, I'm Luis Dole. I was born in a Christian home. My dad is my pastor, so since I have memory, I went to church every week of my life. I got saved when I was 16 years old. Then God called me to serve Him in a full time. When that happened, I didn't know where to go to study. I didn't know about a seminary in Honduras. My sister told me about New Life Baptist Seminary. So I came here, and since I came here, the seminary had helped me to grow up in my spiritual life and my personal life. I had preached the gospel to the people around here. This is my last year here. I don't know what I'm going to do after I graduate here, but I know if, that I want to serve God every day of my life. In 2015, um, I contacted Brother James Lejeune, uh, who already spoke Spanish, uh, to be able to come here and to work in our seminary, to teach in our seminary. And uh, since that time, uh, he's been here serving faithfully in the ministry for three semesters, teaching in our Bible college. And his wife, Susie, has been teaching in our Christian school for six years now. And we're excited about what the Lejeunes uh, are going to be doing in the future in our ministry. Uh, also working in the bus ministry, teaching and preaching in our church, and helping with the soul winning program. And we would appreciate anything that the churches could do to be able to support them and to help them to come back to Honduras as soon as possible to continue here in the ministry of the New Life Baptist Church. Thank you very much. I'd like to recommend James and Susie Lejeune as missionaries to Honduras. They've already been on the mission field. They're already familiar with the language. They're already serving or in an, are involved in a ministry in Honduras. And as such, Riverside, their sending church, recognizes God's call upon their life and their training for service. And we're fully behind them in this next step of ministry that God has for them. Go sound the horn, strike up the Honduras not only needs the gospel, it needs trained Honduran men and women to carry out the Great Commission. We invite you to join us in our endeavor through your prayers and financial support. We are the Lejeunes, planting churches through training nationals. Amen. Very moving. Ushers, if you begin to make your way forward and receive this evening's offerings, our tithes, offerings, and faith promise giving. And uh, our church is not uh, in a place right now where we're going to be taking on missionaries for the next little while. But when the day, day and time comes where we start taking on missionaries again, uh, we may consider uh, the Lejeunes. Amen? Amen. And so uh, that'll be uh, something we'll review later down the road. We're excited to have them here tonight. They are living... Uh, somewhat semi-close up in Southington as a ascending area and so it was very convenient for them to come down here and be with us this evening. Let's pray and we'll collect uh, this evening's offerings. Brother Gisarni, if you would raise your voice, lead us in prayer.
Turn one more time in your hymnals to hymn 212, Shepherd, or excuse me, Savior like a shepherd lead us, hymn 212. We'll sing the first and the fourth. <clears throat> Savior like a shepherd lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Number four. Early let us seek thy favor, early let us do thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love our bosoms fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Amen. S setting all the, the kidding aside, I'm very proud of my brother and the fine young man that he's become. We, When you grow up in the same household, you... You share a lot of memories of a lot of things you can cut up about and laugh about, but there are also those times where you step back and you look at uh, your little brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest of seven. James is number four of seven. Uh, we don't refer to each other by the numbers, amen, but he was number four of seven, and uh, you know we, we watched, him, uh, watched him grow up, and um, I'm, I guess, what, seven, eight years older than you are, somewhere in that range, and just uh, really enjoyed getting to be his brother and, and watching him mature in the Lord. I remember one year for Christmas, we did the whole exchange thing where you exchange names. And, you, you know, you don't buy a gift for all seven siblings because mom and dad have to pay for everybody to buy all the gifts when you're that age, amen? So you exchange names and you buy for each other. And James got uh, my name uh, that one particular Christmas. He must have been 10 or 11 years old. And uh, James wrote on a piece of paper and, and stuck it in a box and that uh, he didn't buy me anything that year. He made a commitment that year. I opened up the gift, and inside the, the box was a piece of paper that said, I promise that in the next calendar year, I will read my Bible from cover to cover. And he signed his name at the bottom as a 10 or 11-year-old boy. And I watched him every day read his Bible and just fall in love with the Lord. And uh, it's, it's been, James, it's been an honor to be your brother. It's been an honor to watch you grow. Um, so happy for you and Susie and the future that God's going to have for you guys in Honduras. And I'm looking forward to the message tonight. Come up and preach for us tonight. Thank you. Is this on? Come on? Okay. Well, amen. And uh, it's a pleasure to always be here and uh, getting all choked up listening to him. And uh, I'm not usually very emotional, but it is a. Uh, I can say this about my oldest brother, uh, you know, I've always had somebody to look up to. Well, I haven't always been able to look up to him. At some point, I surpassed him, but, <laughs> but uh, you get what I'm saying. Let's go into our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to preach a, a message. It's going to be uh, two parts to it, um, so I didn't know exactly how to, how to title the message, uh, but... There's two parts of the message, and the title I gave it and, uh, is, How Can You Pray uh, for Your Missionaries? How Can You Pray for Your Missionaries? And um, so this is somewhat a message on prayer. We're going to start it out as being a message on prayer, and uh, something that we can never hear too much of. And uh, so we'll go ahead and read this passage in Matthew chapter 6, and, um, and let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray that the Lord speaks to us this evening. And, um, and as I'm sure he will. Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here uh, with uh, everyone here. And I ask that you would just uh, use your word to convict our hearts and that you would strengthen us and 
uh, uh, sh uh, strengthen our resolve to live for you and uh, to be growing uh, more and more in sanctification, uh, that we would uh, be growing more in sanctification and further, further apart from the world and, and in a sense and closer to you and uh, closer to your holiness. And I uh, ask that you would just strengthen us now. We ask everything to be done for your honor, for your glory. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 6, and here we have, we find ourselves in uh, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, three chapters that cover uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, a wonderful sermon, uh, no preacher has ever surpassed it, and uh, as the words have come from the very words of, of Jesus Christ. And uh, so Matthew chapter 6, he gets, uh, Jesus is continuing, and uh, chapter 6 he talks about externalism, he talks about uh, a lot of times... Um, uh, you know, we've all seen it, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you'll see somebody who is one way, and then they're, they're a different way uh, when they're around other people. And uh, it talks about the Pharisees and their externalism. Uh, it starts off in chapter 6 talking about alms and not letting your uh, uh, one hand knowing what your other hand is doing. And uh, it gets down to verse uh, 6, and let's go ahead and pick up in verse 6 and read to verse 13. Uh, chapter 6, verse 6 through 13, the Bible reads, But thou... When thou prayest, and notice it doesn't say if thou prayest, it says when thou prayest. And uh, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Ask... After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed or hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And uh, we're going to uh, just get into this a little bit. I have a few introductory points and, uh, to, to get into. And, uh, but we see here, uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, uh, 7, uh, we see, or I'm sorry, uh, chapter 5, verse 5, he talks about uh, praying. And you know, he says in verse uh, 6, actually, it says, But thou, when thou prayest, and my first point is private prayer is commanded. Private prayer is commanded. And... Uh, what, and, and, and I've often wondered, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, being a Christian or, or, um, is not uh, difficult to get saved. It's not difficult to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, one simple look of faith and acknowledgement that uh, I'm a sinner. Uh, I cannot make it to heaven on my own merit. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And one simple look of faith to Jesus Christ, uh, like the, uh, the thief on the cross who had that one simple look of faith, uh, he had lived a life of sin and debauchery. However, that last look of faith before he bowed his head and died, uh, he was with the Lord Jesus in paradise that day. And uh, that, that was all it takes. And so being a Christian is not, not what's difficult. But get, not getting there is difficult, but really uh, growing uh, like we ought to is difficult. And, and so many Christians, uh, they, they, uh, they get saved, they, they ask the Lord Jesus into their heart, and, uh, and, and they, at some point they just plateau. And, uh, you know, I've heard someone say you're, you're either growing or you're, or you're, uh, you're backsliding. Uh, it's either up or down, really, as far as uh, in terms of growth. And uh, you don't really uh, stagnate. And so, uh, but one of the marks of a mature Christian is when uh, the, the Christian can, uh, on a regular basis, go to the Lord in private, in the privacy, and pray on a regular basis. And uh, that, that is easier said than done. And you, you might think to yourself, well, well, how hard is it really to just get alone and just pray every day? That doesn't seem like it should be that hard. But, you know, it's amazing how, and if you're, you've been in this uh, for any length of time now, you know that when you go to pray, uh, every distraction uh, you can possibly imagine is there. And uh, you think of everything. And a lot of times you think of good things that are uh, not necessarily bad things, things that you need to get done that day, and things that are good things, but things that aren't, aren't prayer. And you, ha you have to say, wait a second, time out, I, you know, I need to pray. And um, so we see here that private prayer is commanded. I'm going to go ahead and take a drink of water. We had Chinese food, and every time I have Chinese food, it dries out my mouth. Amen? 
should have went with a Panera Bread or something. No, I'm just kidding. And uh, so private prayer is commanded. And uh, so not, if, the, not if, if thou pray, but when thou prayest. And it is probably the hardest thing that, I, you know, in my opinion, it's probably the hardest thing that in, in the Christian life is private prayer. It, it really is. And, the, and I often wonder why, and I scratch my head and I say, why is this the hardest thing in my life to, to overcome? It doesn't seem like it should be that hard, but why is it so hard? And uh, the conclusion I've come to is that private prayer is the hardest thing uh, because it's private. Uh, no one's watching. And so much of what we do, we really have to scratch our, he- uh, scratch our heads. We have to ask ourselves, uh, why do I do what I do? And uh, is it to be seen of men? Is it just so other people will see me in church and know I'm there? And, and we really have to ask ourselves that. And, uh, you know, one of the gauges, one way you can tell, uh, you know, a good motive checker, uh, a good check of motives, why am I doing what I'm doing, is uh, you can see how much time you're spending in prayer in private. And uh, not, not together, but in private. And uh, just you and the Lord alone in prayer. And uh, that, that's convicting, if you think about it. If you really think about how much time have I prayed this past week, if you really had to put down a number, if, you ha- if I had you all take out a, a piece of paper and say, write down a number of minutes, just a, a, an, a, uh, an estimate, how much minutes or how many, uh, would it even be in the, into hours? I mean, and that's convicting. A lot of times we get to our, on our hands and knees and, and uh, we feel like our, our words are bouncing off the ceiling. And uh, that, that's a common, a common feeling. And uh, uh, one thing that's very important as a side note that I want to add is that we don't treat prayer, and this is uh, something that we're uh, very guilty of, we treat prayer as an ends to a, ends to a mean, or I'm sorry, a means to an end instead of the end. And uh, we treat prayer as if uh, uh, God exists for our happiness, as if God exists for us. And uh, the Bible says that uh, all things were created for his pleasure, and for his pleasure we, are, uh, we were created. And uh, for his glory. And time and time again we see in the scriptures, uh, God does not exist for us. The angels don't exist for us. Heaven doesn't exist for us. Not everything in the world exists for us. And uh, we adopt a, a humanistic mindset. And uh, we, we mix humanism and religion. And we say, God exists for me. And, and, and what can God do for me? And what is, what's, in, what's, what's in it for me? What, what's Christianity got for me? What's, what, where's my happiness? And uh, so many Christians remain in, in shallow territory because they'll never leave this what's in it for me mindset, and uh, that mindset carries over into prayer. And uh, we, we, we want to know what's in it for me. We don't see instant results. We're, we're so used to the, uh, our, our pulling out our iPhones or our, our, our smartphones and getting instant results, whatever we want, uh, be it fast food. And so things are, we're, we're slaves to the immediate. We have everything immediate. And uh, that, that, that Western culture that we live in, uh, I really think has damaged our, our, our uh, awareness that yeah, God does not work on an immediate timetable. God does not work on an immediate timetable, and he's not going to work on, on just an instant, instant gratification, instant, uh, you know, you pray something and it just arrives at your doorstep. Uh, God doesn't work on that way. You can see in scripture, uh, example after example in the Old Testament uh, of people uh, in prayer and, uh, for a long time in prayer, and they, 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 they uh, persevered in prayer, and uh, some of them eventually availed with God, and they, 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 they uh, God answered the prayer, but, you know, God doesn't always work on our timetable. So it's important, as a side note, not to treat prayer as if it's a means to an end. You know, it's to be in the presence of God. It's not to just get something from Him. It's just to be with Him. And uh, the problem is we, we look at prayer all wrong. And uh, we, we look at prayer as if, if it's to get us something. And uh, if, if that's your mindset, you're not going to be praying for very long. So perhaps the reason why you're not praying, the reason why you don't go to God in private prayer, the reason why we fail to go to God in private prayer is uh, because uh, no one's watching. Perhaps it's because it's uh, nothing but a means to an end, nothing to get, get you what you want. And that's how you, that's how you sort of just view all of life is just how can I manipulate things in, in such a way uh, life is like a chessboard and you move things around and try to get what you want and, and, and you manipulate everything around. And, and prayer doesn't work to your favor like everything else seems to do, so you, you, you give up on prayer. And that, that's very important that, that we don't treat prayer as a means to an end. It should never be a means to an end. And uh, so private prayer is something that we're commanded to do. It's something that we should put in our schedule. You know, we all have... Uh, 24 hours a day, and uh, we all have 168 hours a week. And uh, uh, you know, some uh, I know in Honduras with the seminary students, um, sometimes I'll hear the excuse, "Well, I didn't have time." And I know that with most of them, uh, their schedules uh, in, the, in the seminary, most of them are on the work scholarship we do after after classes. They go to lunch around 12, and after that they go to work, and, and they only work four hours a day, believe it or not. 
And so I, I always tell them when I was in college, and uh, I know my brother can testify, uh, you know, when I, when I was in college, uh, going to work right after uh, classes, and, uh, and then being, not coming back to the college till close to midnight, and I remember, uh, for me, uh, ha- having to stay up till 3 or 4 in the morning to get a project done. So I look at them, the seminary students, and say, listen, time is never an excuse. Time is never an excuse. And uh, we all have the same amount of time. It's not time, it's priorities. It's what you choose to do with that time. And, uh, you know, so, uh, so it is with prayer, priorities. And uh, I know for me personally, um, if I get up in the morning and if I decide to do too many things, eventually I, I just... That the longer I wait to get on my knees and pray, the longer I wait to read my Bible and spend time with the Lord, the harder it is to pray and read my Bible. The harder it is just to take time. Because at some point, and it's amazing, when you wake up in the morning, it's just it's like the ball starts rolling, the, the, the stone starts rolling downhill. And the uh, longer it rolls downhill, the faster it rolls. And you can't stop it, and uh, you're already going. And you, get, you wait till you get to 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, and you want to stop. Or you wait to a certain point of the day, and uh, maybe you have a work schedule. You have to be at work by a certain time. And uh, you know that if you wait till after work, you're not going to feel like uh, doing that. You're just going to feel tired. And so very important that um, we, we, we prioritize these things. Perhaps it's at nighttime, but whenever the schedule you have, to follow through with it and pray. And it's something that's so hard. So many uh, distractions can come your way. And, you know, if a distraction, I, I don't know about you, but when, I know sometimes when I pray, uh, you know, everything in the world comes to my attention. I mean, I think about everything. And I already have a mindset and my brother can tell you, my, I, I think if I was born in, in a home that wasn't a Christian home, I would have been diagnosed with ADD, and I would have been on medicine my entire life. I probably wouldn't, and I say that sort of half-jokingly, but uh, my, my parents used the paddle instead of uh, uh, Ritalin or medicine, and uh, that's honestly what, what cured it for me. And, uh, but, I, you know, to this day, it, I say cured it, but to this day, I'm still uh, prone to... to uh, you know, look at a squirrel walking, uh, going by or, you know, look at whatever uh, might deviate my attention. That's, that's just me. I'm very um, uh, much of a, maybe an I personality impulsive, and I think of things, and there's some strengths to it, but there's also a lot of weaknesses, and that is when I know when I'm praying, if I'm not careful, uh, I'm thinking about something uh, unrelated, and I'm not even paying attention to prayer. And so uh, I, know, I know for me, when I think of things, sometimes it helps me to get out a pen and paper and write down what I'm thinking of, especially if it's something I need to do that day. I write it and release it. You ever hear that, write it and release it? And uh, you write it, release it, you put it on paper, and you go back to prayer. And you spend that time in prayer, and uh, you do that, and it'll, it'll really, uh, really uh, help you out. And so, uh, number one, private prayer is commanded. Number two, prayer, and we'll go to the next verse, prayer is asking God for what he already knows we need. Prayer is asking God for what he already knows we need. And so uh, we get to the next verse. It says, um, verse 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And so, uh, you know, you, uh, you imagine a, a Pharisee or somebody who's praying uh, a prayer, they would say some, the same words over and over and over again, thinking that if I say, if I say it maybe a hundred 150 times, eventually God will say, wow, he, he's saying it a lot of times. I think I'll finally listen, listen to what he's saying. And uh, Jesus is rebuking that. He's saying, don't use vain repetitions. Listen, God already knows what you, what you have need of. God already knows everything you need. In fact, he knows what you need more than you know what you need. And so when you, when you pray, uh, don't use vain repetitions. God already knows what you need. Uh, God wants to hear you uh, uh, and uh, humbly bow before him and ask for those things. He wants you to recognize what you need. And uh, so when you pray, use not rain repetitions, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. And so um, Jesus already knows, the Father already knows the things that we need. In fact, the Bible says uh, that the Holy Spirit uh, makes uh, utterances for us, uh, uh, makes growing uh, intercession. The Holy Spirit intercedes for our prayers. And the Holy Spirit is interceding on behalf of us the things that we don't know we need. And uh, that's, that's an amazing thing, I think, the fact that the Holy Spirit can take what we need and can uh, inter- intervene, intercede for us. Amen? And so we get to the Lord's Prayer. And uh, number three, the Lord's Prayer, how should we pray? How should we pray? And this will be uh, somewhat quick. I'm going to get into the other part of the message, and that is how can you pray for your missionaries? But how, sh- how should we pray? What is the Lord's Prayer? And, of course, you look at a prayer like this, and it's only a few verses long, and you think to yourself, well, you know, this is simple. Just get down on my hands and knees and just say, Our Father which art in heaven, uh, the kingdom come, that will be, and just pray, just recite that, and, and I'll be done, and I, I'm good. 
And, uh, you know, but you look at time and time again in the scriptures, uh, when Jesus uh, uh, separated himself from the crowds, when he prayed, it wasn't just a few sentences. Uh, Jesus knew how to tarry in prayer. And right before uh, the crucifixion, of course, he tarried long in prayer with his three disciples, Peter, James, and John. In fact, he kept, he kept coming back and, and uh, he kept uh, seeing them fall asleep. And uh, so uh, what you see here in this uh, model prayer, every, every verse or every phrase here could be, an ex- could be expanded upon. What you see here, you can expand upon. You could spend five or six, seven, eight minutes, ten minutes uh, praying. And uh, for instance, and we'll go, we'll go through this real quick. Uh, it says, uh, after this manner, therefore pray ye, verse 9. Our Father which art in heaven, okay, so we know we're supposed to address who when we pray. We're supposed to address our Father. Uh, our Father which art in heaven, and look at these next words, hallowed or hallowed be thy name. And so we see here, uh, uh, we're supposed to look at and, and, and reverence and bring praise and adoration uh, to the name of Jesus. This is, uh, this is uh, exal- exalting the name, uh, God's name. And so when you say the word hallowed, that is something that is uh, holy. It's sanctified. It's set apart. And it's not that God's name isn't already hallowed, but the problem is it's not hallowed in our minds. It's not hallowed within our hearts. It's not hallowed within our being. Uh, God's name becomes, and, and we, we use the phrase using God's name in, in vain, and uh, uh, it, it becomes uh, just uh, sort of uh, common. And we get used to God's name. And I think of the Jews, whenever they heard, uh, they had the names of, of Jehovah and Yahweh. When they heard those names, they were such sac- so sacred names that they trembled uh, upon hearing those names. And how, what reverence that, what fear they had behind the name of God. And so hallowed be thy name. When you pray, what praise and adoration can you give to God? What praise and adoration can you say, God, you are worthy of, of, of everything I can give you and more. And, and, and coming before God and exalting his name in your heart, soul, and mind. Exalting who he is. Hallowing his name in, uh, within you. Hallowed be thy name. I want God's name to be lifted up. I want God's name to be exalted uh, within me so I can see how uh, I can see God glorified. Hallowed be thy name. And then we get to verse 10. Uh, God, uh, it says, verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And here we see in verse 10, God's will over my will. God's will over my will. And uh, verse, verse uh, 10, thy kingdom come. So it's God's kingdom coming. It's a prayer for God's kingdom to come. And it says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This is, the pr- this is a prayer. This is uh, introductory. Before we get into uh, p- making petitions, we have just exalted God's name. We have just hallowed God's name. Now we're going to tell God, God, your will is more important than my will. Because you know best. You are sovereign. You know everything. You know what's best for me. And so if I ask for something, but, but you know it, would, it really wouldn't be best for me, if, if there's an affliction in my life that maybe I, I'm asking that you would take away a, a thorn in the flesh like uh, Paul had, if, if there's some, some thing that I, I really don't like, uh, uh, but, but it's necessary for my growth or it's necessary for your glory, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's your will more important. And this is so important when we pray. And uh, there's examples in the Old Testament of people who have prayed and who have prayed and prayed and prayed. And there's a, the expression, uh, be careful what you ask for. And uh, there's people, uh, I think of Hezekiah, who prayed for uh, extra years to be added on to his life. And, and, and there are people in the Bible who pray for something. God finally gave it to him, and it wasn't always the best thing. And so we always want to make sure when we pray, that we pray that God's will o- overall uh, be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we get to verse 11, and this is where I, I want us to pick up and notice some things. Verse 11, it says, give us this day our daily bread. And you notice that word, our. And uh, verse 12, it says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 13, it says, and lead us not into temptation. So here we go, and to the rest of the prayer, uh, from then on, becomes uh, first person plural, we. And uh, that's what it becomes, first person plural. So now, not only am I praying for all, uh, my, my daily needs, and, and the list goes on and on, uh, but now, now I'm not only praying for myself, but I'm also uh, going to the Father on behalf of those around me. And so now it's give us this day our daily bread. And now I'm not just praying for my daily bread, I'm praying for the daily bread of other people. And so we get to verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. And uh, now I'm praying for the needs 
Uh, our daily bread represents the needs that we have, daily needs, our daily uh, bread. And so, uh, and uh, now I'm going uh, to go, we're going to go ahead and go to verse 12 and 13. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And uh, here we have in verse 12, uh, uh, talking about forgiveness. And under the law, uh, forgiveness was necessary to be forgiven. But then we uh, look at Ephesians 4.32. Uh, Ephesians 4.32 says, and let's, let's go ahead and go there and read it. And, and uh, some of you may have it memorized. But now that we're not under the law, we're under grace. Ephesians 4.32 says, and uh, look at what it says. It says, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted. What's that next word? Forgiving one another. And the reason, the motive for forgiveness, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So I, I'm now uh, not forgiving to be forgiven. Now I'm forgiving because I am forgiven. Amen? And uh, it's a perspective. And Jesus tells the parable of the, uh, of the steward who uh, uh, was forgiven a, a great debt. And uh, he turned around and would not forgive uh, his fellow servant who owed, owed him a much smaller debt. And so now, as Christians, we have been forgiven of such a great sin debt, uh, of such great sins. And when we fail to forgive others, it is because we fail to see our own depravity. We fail to see our own sin nature. We fail to see how much we have offended a holy and righteous God. And when we cannot forgive somebody else because of something, uh, some petty offense towards us, or even a larger offense, it is because we fail to see the magnitude of our sin towards a holy God. And so verse 12, and forgive us our debts. And so now we know we're not supposed to be praying if we have not forgiven other people. And uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In verse 13, it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so we're supposed to also pray for, uh, that the Lord will not lead uh, me and other people, that the Lord will not lead us into temptation. And uh, you know, you've seen uh, uh, the devil is real, Satan is real, uh, his powers, the powers in the darkness of this world are very real, and, um, and uh, you know, but God is in control. And so you pray and you ask the Lord to deliver, uh, to deliver us from temptation, the temptations that come every day. And I always think of, uh, when I think of temptation, the, that word temptation, I always think of 1 Corinthians 10.13. And let's go ahead and look at that verse real quick, 1 Corinthians 10.13. The Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. And that's key right there. God is faithful. Amen? God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, uh, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. And so God does not give a temptation, or God does not allow, I should say, God does not allow a temptation uh, greater than we can bear. And uh, he gives a way to escape every single time. So now I'm going to transition. How can you pray for your missionaries? I know that uh, other missionaries come through this church, and I know that when I was growing up, I used to have uh, always grab the prayer cards off of people's tables, and uh, you know I would accumulate prayer cards. And, and a lot of times, uh, I know that when we pray for other people, especially if we're in a hurry, uh, I know the tendency is to really just and, and bless so-and-so and bless so-and-so, and, and all the missionaries in the entire world, amen. And uh, just say that, and that, that just covers it, amen. And uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a man in our, our church in Honduras, and uh, he, go, he comes to the prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, uh, the men's prayer meeting. We have a men's and a women's prayer meeting, and he'll come in there and he'll raise his hand and say, I like to uh, pray for the peace in the world and for all the pastors in all the countries and everywhere. And I think, wow, that just covers it. Amen. And uh, he prays for that. And uh, so, uh, but uh, now, we're, now I want to get into how can you take time as you, look, as you pull out your prayer cards. And I, I was actually talking to a, uh, a young, uh, not young, but a couple recently, and uh, young in heart, amen. And uh, uh, a couple recently, and uh, they were telling me how they pray for missionaries at one of the churches that we were just at. And they said that they have a basket, and uh, they have a stack of cards uh, for all the missionaries that they, they've collected. And uh, every day, uh, he and his wife get together, and they take about five minutes, just pray for that one missionary. And they just pray for one a day. And um, now you may look at that and think, well, just one missionary a day, you have so many. But, but really, they're going for quality over uh, quantity. And they really want to just pour themselves and just pray for uh, specifically. I think a lot of times we're guilty of, because we're trying to rush through our prayers, we're guilty of not praying specifically. And uh, the fact that we don't pray specifically, uh, you know, do you really believe that God's going to answer your prayers? Uh, why don't you throw out numbers to God? Why don't you give God something more specific to work with? 
And uh, do you believe that God is powerful? And uh, do, you, do you really believe it? So, uh, you know, it's important not just to rush through people, well, God bless so-and-so. Uh, and th- th- that vague word, God bless so-and-so, what does that even mean? And, uh, you know, God, God uh, how can God bless that person? And really think of ways that, and so I, right now I just want to give you a quick list, and I know uh, this, will, this will only take a few minutes. Uh, for sake of time, we'll run through this, but what are some of the needs that you can pray for? Some of the needs that uh, missionaries needs you can pray for. And so number one, pray that the missionaries, pray that they stay focused on the Lord and not the opposition. Pray that they stay focused on the Lord and not the opposition. And, uh, you know, even being there, there's, we've had the opportunity in Honduras to get to know other missionaries, and we have a conference every year in, uh, in February, I believe it is, or January. It's February. And uh, it's, uh, all, the, all, all the American missionaries get together, a lot of them do, and uh, we have a conference, and we, it's in English, and so we can kind of sit back and relax and just listen in our own language. And, uh, but we have a conference, and uh, it's been such a joy to get to know the missionaries, but one thing that, that is so true on the mission field is that uh, it is so easy to take your focus on why you're really there. And uh, it's, it's focus on your problems. And, and it could be the same said for uh, pastors that are here in America. And, uh, but just pray that the missionaries will ultimately stay focused on the Lord and not get discouraged. There's so many obstacles that come the way. There's so, so many obstacles. And so many times they become fixated on the obstacles. They don't think there's a way out. And uh, they, they just become so. And the obstacles grow and grow and grow. And uh, eventually they get discouraged. And that, that giant of discouragement. And they leave the country. They leave the mission field, and every year there's plenty of missionaries, plenty of them, that leave the mission field, and they come back, and they're discouraged. And so uh, pray that they will stay focused on the Lord and not so much the opposition. Number two, pray for uh, their marriage. Pray for their marriage. And, and really, pray for their family, I should say, and uh, family. You know, you may not think of it, but missionaries, a lot of times, they have wives, and the, the, the wives, and they have kids. Now, my wife and I don't have any kids yet, and, and, uh, but, you know, it, you know, just as Satan can attack a, a marriage between a pastor and a wife, he can attack it there. And uh, there, are, there are lots of missionaries. Even as I speak, there's lots of missionaries that have marital problems. And on the mission field, right there, have marital problems. And uh, it, it's a very real thing. There's, even as I speak, there's missionary kids and, uh, that, that grow up and they are rebellious or, you know, they uh, Satan finds his way, gets a foothold, or I'm sorry, a stronghold, gets his foot in the door, and uh, really attacks the missionary kids. And uh, just because you're on the mission field doesn't exempt you from uh, temptation, doesn't exempt you from all those things. And uh, so pray for, uh, pray for the family, pray for the marriage. Pray that God will keep the marriage strong, that, the kids. And uh, if you have a prayer card and you can pray for the kids individually, uh, pray for them by name. Uh, I'd encourage you to uh, just go down the list on the names and just pray and think, think of maybe what they would struggle with and, and pray specifically for them. And uh, number three, uh, pray for their health. Pray for their health. And um, I'll, I'll tell a quick story real fast. Uh, my wife, uh, this past, um, this past uh, uh, year, uh, or earlier this year, I should say, uh, we were in Honduras. My wife uh, had, some, had some health issues, and she had a pain in her side, a cough that wouldn't go away. And we eventually found it was bronchitis, and uh, we ended up, uh, she ended up having a fainting spell, and I caught her, and I picked her up, and I, I uh, didn't know what to do, so I ran to the bathroom, put, put her in the shower, and turned on the cold water. And uh, I don't know if that's what I was supposed to do. Uh, you know, I don't know, but it worked, and the cold water woke her up, and, uh, and I ended up taking her to a, uh, she had a really high fever and fainting spells, and her body was rejecting water. It didn't want to even hold down water. And uh, so we, I took her to the doctor because I thought, well, if she's dehydrated, her body won't even accept water. And so I took her to the doctor that day, and, uh, you know, one doctor after another, and the pain was still there in her side, and, and she was coughing. And every time it, she coughed, it just hurt so much in her chest and, and uh, on her side, and she just felt so bad. And so, uh, yeah, I was, I was getting worried, and we kept going to more doctors, and it was getting more expensive, and we're paying more money. And every time you go to another doctor's office, I don't know if you've experienced this, but every time you go to another doctor's office, you feel like the story gets longer. And uh, you have to tell that next doctor a story that's uh, that much longer. And by the time you get to the fourth or fifth doctor, the story is so long, you just, you don't even want to tell it anymore. You're just frustrated. You're like, all right, well, you know, just, you know, this is, this is what she's had, uh, problem she has. I'm not going to tell you about all the other doctors I've been to. And, uh, but, you know, uh, that time was a very trying time. It, uh, we got to one, uh, one uh, Sunday where uh, she was starting to get a little better, but she had a, a pain in her chest. Well, you know, her brother, uh, Josh, 
just had open heart surgery, and he's only uh, 23 years old, I think it is, 23 or 24. And so I thought to myself, well, people who have chest have heart attacks. And I'm thinking to myself, it's Sunday, and the doctor's office in, in Savannah Grande, where we live, is closed. And I think to myself, the closest doctor is in the capital city, and what would happen if she had a heart attack? And so I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning these things to her, not knowing that her heart, as she's hearing me say it, is, is racing faster, boom, 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 boom. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, hope you don't have a heart attack, and now she's, her heart is beating really fast out of anxiety. And so I, I call, I'm over the outside on, on, the, on the deck out behind the house. I'm calling the pastor, and I say, uh, what would happen if she had a heart attack? And she's boom, 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 you know. Uh, you know and I, I, so uh, we, we, I ended up driving her, and we ended up uh, getting all the way to the capital city, and we got to the, this place that's called Hospital Escuela. It's a place where um, university students are interns, and they, they train. And so I, you know, we're there, and, and uh, I'd never, we'd never been in a hospital. I mean, zero, zero privacy, no privacy. I mean, I'm just having to close my eyes because of all the things that, that are there and uh, the women and whatnot, and I'm, I'm just there. And, and they're, they're kicking family members out, and I, I looked at Susie, and I didn't want to leave her there by herself, and she was so scared to be there by herself, and they're kicking family members out. So I, I looked at, I looked at the, the lady, and I said, no, no, no habla inglés. I just looked at her and said, it doesn't speak English. Or, I'm sorry, no, it doesn't speak Spanish, I'm sorry. I said, no habla español. And so I said that, and hoping that I could be her translator. I said, Susie, I'm going to be your, uh, I'm going to be your translator so I can stay here because I don't, I don't really trust this place. And so we stay there, and they're asking her questions, and they're asking her, are you sick, and this and that. And, and, uh, and uh, before I can even translate, they ask her, are you sick, and where, where, where do you hurt? She's already pointing to the area in her body where she's hurting, and I say, Susie, they're going to know that you really know Spanish, and uh, they're not, I'm going to be dispensable, and they're going to kick me out. So, you know, that was... Uh, Shouldn't have lied, shouldn't have said that, but uh, when, you're in a, when you're in a situation sometimes, you, you want to be there with your wife and uh, you be there and help her through it. And, uh, but, you know, health problems is a very real thing, and it really is something that happens all the time. And there's not always the medical care, and there's not always the, a lot of times uh, doctors said there's a, a missionary, uh, uh, Pastor uh, Gutierrez, the Gutierrez family in Tegucigalpa, uh, wife had cancer, she had to come back here for, for uh, chemo treatments. And those are things that really... Uh, uh, prevent the work from going, going forward. And so just pray for their health and uh, pray, for, pray for their health. Uh, next, pray for visa and residency. And uh, pray for visa and residency. And pray for their legal status within the country. And uh, this is something that's very important. Uh, a lot of times missionaries have problems with visa status. And uh, just pray for that. And uh, last, last, number five, pray that the Holy Spirit will go before them and will convict hearts of their sin. And uh, that's something that's so important. And something that I'll share with you as the last thing before we close in prayer, but uh, I think a lot of times, you know, I know before I went to Honduras personally, I just had this idea that uh, everybody there would be hungry for the gospel. I just had this idea that people wanted to hear it. And so I got there, and I went there, and I witnessed, and I discovered that not everyone here wants to hear the gospel. And I remember talking to a lady uh, recently, or months ago, and she looked at me, and this is the most honest person I've ever had out souling. She looked at me, and she said, well, I don't really want to do that. She said, I'm not really living right, and, but I don't really want to change the way I'm living. So I'd rather just continue the way I'm living. Most honest person I've ever heard. And I appreciated her sincerity. I really did. I appreciated her honesty. Because she knew that if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get saved, I, I, this is, this is, I have to repent uh, you know, in my heart. And, uh, and, uh, but... That, that really is the story of some of them. They, they, the gospel is available to them. It's accessible to them. They can get it. But some of them just prefer to, to uh, remain in their sin, to continue in it. And uh, it's, it's, such a, uh, it's so sad. And so pray that the Lord will go, even before your own, your own Jerusalem, around this community, pray that the Holy Spirit will work in people's lives. And people, uh, people cannot get saved without Holy Spirit conviction. A person cannot get saved unless he's been convicted of his sin. Uh, also, uh, you, you, take away, you take away conviction, a person's just praying a prayer, and there's not true salvation. A person has to feel a conviction of the fact that they've sinned against the holy God. That, ha- that conviction absolutely has to be there, and uh, that, that's so important. So just pray, uh, just pray for that. And uh, just, uh, this message is an encouragement to pray. If you've neglected prayer, uh, you know if you have or not, or if it's something you struggle with. Uh, and I believe uh, it's something that, if we're honest with ourselves, something we all struggle with from time to time. And uh, let's, let's make commitments tonight. Let's make a commitment tonight to uh, renew our commitment to uh, every morning to go before the Lord in prayer. And uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, the Bible says, availeth, what's the next word? Much. Availeth much. 
And uh, let's not take lightly the power of prayer and what God can do uh, uh, to and through us. Amen? Let's go ahead and bow before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this evening. And I would ask that you would just help every single one of us. This is not an easy message to preach because this is uh, something that's so hard to do personally. But I ask, Lord, that you would just convict our hearts. You would convict us if we pass our time in prayer. You would, you would prick us in our hearts. If we, we miss our time in prayer, you would prick us and say, hey, you forgot to pray. Lord, I ask that you would, you would do just that in our lives. You would help us to be faithful to our prayer, help us to mature in that area, to read our Bibles. And Lord, please help us not to treat you as a means to an end. Lord, help us not to just treat you as, uh, as, uh, as a, just a way to, uh, to, get, to get something. Lord, you are so worthy of glory. You are so worthy of our entire being. And yet, so many times you get so little out of us. So Lord, I ask that you would just prick our hearts. Help us to be stronger in prayer. Even though it's not fun, even though we don't get things immediately out of it, Lord, I ask that you would just give us your strength. We ask that you would just help us uh, every day to pray more and more fervently, pray for each other, and that you would help uh, to keep us to pray without ceasing day after day. While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, we'll go ahead and have a time of invitation. And I'll go ahead and head it over to the pastor. Let's stand to our feet. As the piano begins to play, the altar's open. I encourage you to come and kneel and pray to the Lord as He's working in your heart and your life. Christian, do you have a time of prayer? Are you praying for your missionaries? Very clear instruction on how to do that. Many of our missionaries that we support, this is a very giving church, very giving church. We support more missionaries than most churches do our size. It's not just enough to put the money in the plate. You've got to pray for them too. Dear Lord, thank you so much for what you've heard this evening. And Lord, just a, a good reminder of how important it is to pray. And Lord, to treat you as though you're here for our glory, Lord, we, we pray for your glory. And Lord, you are the end. And God, what a powerful thought. And Lord, I pray that we would labor much in prayer for each other. And Lord, for our missionaries. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brother James Lejeune, thank you very much for that. What an encouraging challenge from God's Word this evening. If you'd take your wife and go on back to the ta back of your table there, and I'd encourage you to pick up a prayer card and, and, uh, and pray for them. Pray for them regularly. Uh, now he's told you how to pray for them. Pray he has enough sense not to give his wife a heart attack. Amen? <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, thank you for being here this evening. It's a joy to have you, and uh, we uh, be praying God gives you a good rest of your week as you go about through the various errands that you have. And uh, if you can, bring your children on by the table and have uh, Brother James sign their Bible. And listen, uh, we, we make a big deal out of sports people and getting autographs and all that. In the grand scheme of eternity, those people aren't, that's diddly squat. Uh, but uh, have the people that come through here and preach behind this pulpit, have them sign your children's Bible. Make a big deal out of that. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll, be dismissed this evening with Alexa, and if you would close us in prayer.